Hello everyone, my name is Lauren Marie Toledo. I am a medical student at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Bradenton. And today um, we'll be discussing blunt abdominal trauma, including those of the liver, spleen, diaphragm, bowel, and pancreas, as well as injuries to the genitourinary system, extremities, and bone. We will run through the important nerves of the lower and upper extremities and then finish off with trauma during pregnancy and compartment syndrome. So for the first subject we have is blunt abdominal trauma. So we are talking about a patient who comes in with blunt abdominal trauma um, as a result of motor vehicle collisions, assaults, falls, and the like. These cases should be taken seriously because it could progress into serious conditions such as arterial disruption, venous disruption, and bowel perforation at less mobile sites, including the terminal ilium, ampulla of evator, and ligament of trites, which is the anatomical boundary separating the upper and lower GI. Within hours of this injury, necrosis can take place because of arterial disruption, venous disruption, Within hours of the injury, necrosis can take place because of arterial disruption. In addition, venous disruption causes thrombosis and ischemia up to 10 days after trauma. We first need to perform a primary survey, including the ABCDEs, which stand for airway, breathing, circulation, disability or neurologic condition, and exposure and environmental control. This will be followed by a secondary survey, which is a more extensive evaluation that includes a head-to-toe evaluation and palpation, complete history and physical, a reassessment of vital signs, and then blood work and imaging. First, we need to look at how the patient is doing hemodynamically. Uh, we are looking for signs of tachycardia, hypotension, or an unstable blood pressure. If unstable, which is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a mean arterial pressure of less than 65, they need to go to the OR. Um, surgery should be performed if the patient requires over four to six packed RBC within 24 hours or if 10 units of packed RBC are needed in total. For children, we need to use the greater than 40 mils per kilogram volume of transfusion as the indication marker. If the patient is internally bleeding but stable, perform imaging to find the source and admit the patient to the ICU for one to two days. Then we will need to transfuse to keep hemoglobin greater than 10 and run a serial hemoglobin hematocrit determination every four to six hours. This is just to look for and monitor bleeding from an organ or fracture complex such as a spleen laceration. No improvement calls for a repeat CT to rule out delayed ischemia or perforation. And for all pelvic, liver, and splenic bleeding, we need to consult and consider interventional radiology. Next, we have diaphragmatic injuries. And these injuries are more common on the left side because on the right side, there's the liver um, to protect the diaphragm. To diagnose a diaphragmatic injury, a CT scan is utilized, but is usually missed. If a CT is suggestive, however, a diagnostic laparoscopy or laparotomy are indicated. Surgery repair should repair all organs to avoid gradual enlargement or herniation of intra-abdominal contents. And higher abdominal pressure causes evisceration through the diaphragm over time. If it, is within one, if it is within one week of the injury, intra-abdominal reduction and repair should be performed. Otherwise, a combined thoracic and abdominal approach should be taken. Thoracic adhesions thicken over time and require thoracotomy. For a small overview of the bowel, in penetrating trauma, such as stab or gunshot wounds, the bowel is the most commonly injured organ. Bowel injury can be seen as surrounding inflammation or contrast or fluid extravasation in CT scans. And a pro 
and a proctoscopy, also known as a rigid sigmoidoscopy, is a procedure done to examine the insides of the rectum and anus, usually to screen for colorectal cancer, but is used in trauma cases to evaluate for rectal injuries. For treatment, surgical removal of weakened and devitalized tissues is performed, followed by a resection of the bowel and subsequent rejoining of the intestines. In patients with more distal rectal injuries or in unstable patients, for example, those with acidosis, hypotension, or hypothermia, then ileostomy or colostomy proximal to the injured colon may be preferred. Pancreatic trauma. To diagnose pancreatic trauma, CT with IV contrast is used to show non-perfused parenchyma or surrounding fluid and or inflammation. A coleangiography may help to localize a bile leak if there is injury to the bile duct. Fortunately, though, most pancreatic injuries are treated without the surgery. Treatment can include patient observation and, if necessary, a laparotomy, which is a surgical resection of the abdominal cavity, can be performed to make way for intraoperative cholangiography and upper endoscopy or esophagogastroduodenoscopy. The liver. The liver is the most common solid organ injured after a penetrating trauma and second most common solid organ injured after a blunt trauma following the spleen. The liver has a dual blood supply, one from the hepatic artery and the other half from the portal vein. So each contribute 50% of the liver's perfusion. Moreover, 75% of the oxygenation comes from the hepatic artery specifically. Preferably using CT for diagnosing, a bio leak or a blood leak is seen on imaging as fluid surrounding the liver. An ultrasound of the right upper quadrant can be performed to allow visualization of Morrison's pouch between Glisson's capsule, which covers the liver parenchyma, and the garotis fascia, which covers renal parenchyma. Treatment options include laparotomy for unstable patients and angioembolization in stable patients that had a CT showing extravasation or pseudoaneurysm. For patients with a bile leak, a percutaneous drain is placed. And if the bile leak continues, then an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram or an ECRP with stent is placed to decompress the distal ducts and accelerate the healing process. A major bile duct injury may require a RU-NY hepaticojejunostomy. For post-operative care of the liver, drains are kept in place until there is less than 10 milliliters a day of bilious output. And at the time of removal, the patient should be already tolerating food on a PO or per orum, orum, per orum by mouth diet. Three other biliary conditions include biloma, hemobilia, and bulimia. The first one, biloma, is a collection of bile outside of the biliary tree and is treated with percutaneous drainage. The second one, hemobilia, is a trauma-associated condition which occurs when there is blood inside of the biliary tree. An ECRP is performed to diagnose this and a treatment includes angioembolization for stable patients, and laparotomy for unstable patients. A possible cause is a ruptured splenic artery aneurysm. The third one, bulimia, is when bile is in the blood vessels, and that is associated with biliary tree obstruction causing increased biliary pressure. Although it has a high mortality rate of 50%, this condition is rare because blood vessels usually have more pressure. Etiologies include trauma, iatrogenic injury, gallstone erosion into the portal vein, and malignancies causing biliary obstruction and fistula. A patient with this condition will show on lab results an elevated direct and total serum bilirubin, 
which is defined as greater than 30 without an increase in liver enzymes. An ECRP can also diagnose bulimia. A major complication is possible embolism of the kidney or lungs with subsequent right-sided heart failure. To treat, sphincterectomy or biliary drainage can relieve the biliary obstruction. Angioembolization can also be done to occlude the fistula, and if the condition persists, surgical repair of the fistula should be considered, which may require resection of the affected hepatic parenchyma. Spleen. As mentioned earlier, the spleen is the most common organ injured after blunt trauma. A contrast CT will show intra-abdominal fluid or active contrast extravasation surrounding the area. Unstable patients undergo laparotomy with splenectomy. Stable patients are in the ICU with serial CBC and transfusion to keep hemoglobin over 10. And angioembolization or laparotomy followed by splenic repair or splenectomy by interventional radiology is indicated in those patients requiring more than four units in 24 hours. Nowadays, splenic repair is not commonly performed because patients can be treated conservatively or with angioembolization alone. post splenectomy patients need to receive hemophilus influenza, streptococcus pneumonia, and Neisseria meningitidis vaccines two weeks after the emergency operation. If, surg if surgery was not emergent, then the vaccines need to be given two weeks beforehand. Our next type of injury is abdominal vascular injuries, and there are two types, the inferior vena cava injury and the portal or mesenteric vein injury. For the inferior vena cava injury, when primary repair or graft is not possible, IVC ligation below the renal vessels is indicated. For injury above the renal vessels, repair is preferred if it is accessible. But if not, patient is transferred to the ICU for 24 to 48 hours for a second look and for vascular repair. For portal or mesenteric vein injury, this has a high mortality, and because of this, all conditions need repair. The exception is a mid or distal superior mesenteric vein injury, in which case ligation is feasible. Now we will move on to genitourinary injuries. The first one we have is of the kidney. And there's a tissue that envelops the kidney and that is called garrotis fascia or garrotis capsule. And the anatomy of the kidney going from anterior to posterior is vein, artery, and renal pelvis. The right renal vein is shorter than the left one and because it has no collaterals, it cannot be ligated. Instead, a nephrectomy would be required. Right renal artery travels posterior to the inferior vena cava, and the left renal vein travels anterior to the aorta and inferior to the superior mesenteric artery. Importantly, it has left adrenal and gonadal vein collaterals, which allow for ligation. Now we are looking at the ureters, and there are three parts of the ureters on this picture. As you can see, we have the upper third, the middle third, and the lower third, or the distal third. These ureters receive blood medially, except for the distal third, or the lower third, which receives lateral blood supply. Now we have bladder injury, which is associated with pelvic fractures. A full thickness injury could be associated with intra or extra peritoneal urinary leak. If a bladder injury is suspected, we need to perform an x-ray or a CT cystogram with delayed images. Urethra. A Foley catheter can enlarge laceration in urethral damage. For males, the urethra is divided into anterior and posterior components. For females, on the other hand, females have shorter urethras and therefore are rarely injured. 
if urethral damage is suspected, perform a retrograde urethrography to rule out contrast extravasation. For diagnosis, a urinalysis test is performed for hematuria. A CT with IV contrast can assess perfusion of the parenchyma. And if perfusion is absent, rule out an embolic event or intimal flap. So we can see the equations on how to um, calculate the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, as well as the sensitivity and specificity. So we can click on this cystogram. We can look on Google what a cystogram is. Over and over, it is mentioned it is used for a urinary bladder rupture. Okay, and then there's also a video detailing retrograde urethrography, which can rule out the contrast extravasation. For treatment, most are treated conservatively with percutaneous drainage of the Foley catheter. However, if the patient remains unstable or has ongoing bleeding, an exploratory laparotomy and repair of active bleeding is performed. Lastly, we have testicular torsion, which can be caused by a poor fixation of the testes by the tunica vaginalis. This is diagnosed with a color Doppler ultrasound. And to treat, emergent expiration is followed by detorsion and fixation of the testes bilaterally, since the contralateral testes is left at a higher risk of torsion. So now we have extremity injuries. And... These are classified as either hard or soft signs of bleeding, but this classification is not as valuable in blunt traumas. For management of arterial injuries, specifically management of flow-limiting arterial injuries, we use surgical repair such as a repair graft or a bypass, and we could also rule out associated nerve injuries. Now, management of arterial injuries that are not flow-limiting include a full anticoagulation of heparin and Coumadin. The duration of full anticoagulation depends on follow-up imaging, but it is usually three to six months. For management of venous injuries, if proximal to the popliteal or axillary veins, then the venous injury needs repair. If not, then the vein can be ligated in addition to the internal jugular if necessary. And if we click this motor grading on the neurovascular exam, we can see that the grading of uh, motor strength is on a scale of 0 to 5, going from no movement at 0, and then at a level 5 is normal strength. And then we also have the ankle brachial index. These are used if soft signs are present, like a small hematoma or a history of recent bleed, brachial systolic pressure, the ankle systolic pressure, and then we have this equation for the ankle brachial index. So now we'll be moving on to the nerves of the upper extremity. And it is easy to test the median, radial, and ulnar nerves respectively by just using the simple game of rock, paper, scissors. And this will be described a little bit more in detail as we go through each individual nerve involved. First, we have the axillary nerve, which has nerve roots C5 to C6. And this provides sensory innervation to the shoulder. It also provides motor to the teres minor and rotator cuff muscles. We can see the teres minor here and the deltoid muscle as well. And then we can see the axillary nerve forcing through and innervating. The origin is in the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, which we see at the top left of this picture. And if injured, the patient will be unable to abduct their arm and there will be numbness and tingling in the lateral aspect of the proximal arm. Here, we can also see the point pointing to the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, right there. Okay, so now we have radial nerves with nerve roots C5 to T1. 
The radial nerve is associated with motor movements such as wrist extension and metacarpophalangeal joints. This is why the paper motion in rock, paper, scissors tests this nerve. It also innervates the brachioradialis muscle, which flexes the forearm at the elbow. Damage to the radial nerve can occur in crutch injuries traveling through the axilla, in mid-humeral fractures, and in radio dislocation of the elbow. Originating from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, it divides into deep and superficial branches at the elbow. The deep branch continues distally as the posterior interosseous nerve. Injury to the deep branch causes wrist drop as it innervates forearm extensors. The superficial branch provides sensation to the dorsum of the hand, thumb, index, and lateral half of the middle dorsally as distal to the second phalanx. Now here we can see the radial nerve sensory innervation by the superficial branch. Moving on to the median nerve. The median nerve provides motor innervation to the anterior compartment of the forearm known as the flexors. Originating from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus, it divides into the anterior interosseous and palmar cutaneous branches at the forearm. The anterior interosseous innervates the lateral flexor compartment while the medial half is innervated by the ulnar nerve. Sensory innervation to the lateral aspect of the palm and to the dorsal distal phalanx of the index, middle, and medial half of the ring finger is provided by the palmar cutaneous branches. In rock, paper, scissors, the rock movement with your hand tests the median nerve because of the motion finger flexion. For the last upper extremity nerve, we have the ulnar nerve. And the ulnar nerve originates from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. And then it travels posterior to the medial epicondyle innervating muscles on the flexors on the medial side of the anterior compartment of the forearm. As it enters the palm through Guion's canal, it provides sensory innervation to the palmar and dorsal aspects of the little finger and medial half of the ring finger. As for motor innervation, it innervates the intrinsic muscles of the hand, except the two lateral lumbricals and the thenar muscles. So for ulnar nerve innervation, here we see the ulnar nerve. And we can see where it comes from in the brachial plexus. And in the right rock, paper, scissors game, when we perform the scissors motion, that tests the ulnar nerve roots C8 to T1 because of the movement of the small muscles of the hand. For lower extremity, we have the genitofemoral nerve with roots L1 to L2. And this nerve travels through the psoas major and divides into the genital branch and femoral branch. The genital nerve innervates the cremasteric muscle and provides sensation to the skin of the scrotum. The femoral branch travels with the femoral nerve and provides sensation to the anterior thigh. That femoral nerve, which is roots L2 to L4, is the largest nerve of the lumbar plexus and it descends lateral to the femoral artery at the inguinal ligament and innervates the sartorius and knee extensors. Injury to this nerve affects anterior thigh sensation, hip flexion, and knee extension. So here's a picture showing the genitofemoral nerve, and we can see the branching point. And we can also go and click this photo for the femoral nerve, and we can see the femoral nerve coursing along with the femoral artery. Lastly, we have the sciatic nerve with roots L4 to S3, and the sciatic nerve travels deep to the piriformis muscle and divides into the tibial nerve and common fibular or peroneal nerve at the popliteal fossa. The tibial nerve innervates the posterior compartment and 
Injury to this nerve impairs plantar flexion. The peroneal nerve wraps around the neck of the fibula and can be injured from fractures at this level. It further divides into deep and superficial fibular nerves for dorsiflexion and foot aversion, respectively. Injury to the sciatic nerve can cause impaired knee flexion and lateral sensation of the thigh and plantar and dorsal foot. Now we'll be looking into bone injuries. Our first bone injury is a posterior humerus dislocation. This type of dislocation is associated with seizures and falling on an internally rotated extremity. With this injury, there is a risk of axillary artery injury due to its anatomical position. Another type of bone fracture is a femur fracture, which can accumulate a lot of blood, about two liters, and before it builds significant pressure. Therefore, it rarely causes compartment syndrome. To treat a femur fracture, you have to immobilize and rule out neurovascular injury. After that, the next step depends on the f- fracture, if it is a mid f- mid-shaft fracture or a distal fracture. If it is in the mid-shaft, then an antegrade intramedullary nail is placed. And we can see that in this photo, um, the mid-shaft femur fracture and how the intramedullary nail If it is distal, then external or internal fixation with plates is executed. And here is the plate fixation for a femur fracture. We also have fractures of the pelvic region, which have the highest mortality among all orthopedic fractures. Pelvic wraps or binders help to temporarily stop the bleeding so that primary and secondary surveys can be performed. And there is a video attached here where you can press that to see more on pelvic wrapping. So we have four types of pelvic fractures, ring disruption, acetabular fractures, sacral fractures, and avulsion fractures. Ring disruption causes a disruption of the pelvic ring and encompasses open book fractures, compression fractures, and vertical shear fractures. Regarding avulsion fractures, management is usually conservative. And x-rays or a physical exam or a CT, which is the preferred best method, is used to diagnose pelvic fractures. We can also see here for management of pelvic fractures, We have um, peritoneal packing, pelvic stabilization, angioembolization, and resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion, REBOA, for patients that are unstable and have a positive FAST or DPL. Before performing any of these techniques, we would need to perform an exploratory laparotomy. Now in this video, we can see a pelvic packing surgery in real time. And it is really important to note the anatomic and physiologic changes of pregnancy because these changes influence assessment, management, and prevention of trauma. Now in pregnancy, the body is working harder than normal. So cardiac output is 20% higher than normal. Partial pressure of the oxygen is increased and oxygen consumption is increased by about 15%. A finding of leukocytosis, um, a measurement of 16,000 cells per millimeter cubed can be a normal finding in, um, in pregnant women. Pregnant women also have a higher risk of aspiration because of a decreased tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and a higher abdominal pressure. The RHD status should be tested if a woman is RHD negative. Then we also need to perform the clay hauer betke test to see if there is fetal blood present in the maternal circulation. If this is positive, 
then an anti-D immunoglobulin, also called Rogam, is given to avoid maternal alloimmunization. Management begins with a primary and secondary survey of the patient. The priority in these cases is always to save the mother, um, and a CT can be performed for any additional needs. This is the preferred method of imaging because this allows less radiation exposure than pelvic x-rays. However, in non-emergent situations, MRI or an ultrasound is preferred over a CT to avoid compression of the inferior vena cava, the patient should be tilted 30 degrees to the left and transfusion is performed as needed using non-pregnant parameters. Our last section is about compartment syndrome. And this is important because um, we need to monitor the increased pressure within a compartment because of the high risk that it can compress vessels and lead to ischemia and tissue necrosis. We can have compartment syndrome in the extremities, which is associated with crushed injuries or fractions, fractures. Tense compartments or pain on passive extension can be presenting signs and symptoms. A striker device is used to measure the compartment pressure. Um, with the normal limit being less than eight millimeters of mercury. If the measurement exceeds 25 millimeters of mercury, then a compartment syndrome is very likely and a fasciotomy should be performed to relieve the swelling and pressure. We have a video here on the striker device for compartment pressure me measurement. And we also have Pictures here of the upper extremity fasciotomy. It's important to note that the forearm has two compartments, a volar compartment and a dorsal compartment. The volar compartment is accessed through the volar ulnar aspect of the arm. Um, we'll make an incision a volar, called a volar ulnar incision, and this begins around three centimeters below the medial epicondyle, running through the volar ulnar aspect of the arm, ending proximal to the ulnar styloid. The dorsal compartment of the upper extremity is accessed through a dorsal incision around two centimeters below the lateral epicondyle and cutting longitudinally to the midline of the dorsum of the wrist. And here's a picture of the incisions of a hand fasciotomy. We can also perform a lower extremity fasciotomy. The lower leg has four compartments, lateral, anterior, superficial, posterior, and deep posterior. These are accessible by two approaches, the first being a double incision fasciotomy and the second being a perifibular approach. The approach that's shown in this image is a double incision, consisting of two incisions, one medial and one lateral. The medial incision begins two centimeters posterior to the tibia, making sure to stay posterior to incise over the gastrocnemius muscle. Beginning two centimeters below the tibial tuberosity, the incision continues two thirds the length of the leg, a pathway that will avoid the saphenous nerve and vein. Two corresponding fascial incisions are made, one into the superficial posterior compartment and the other into the deep posterior compartment. The second incision is made one centimeter anterior to and two centimeters below the fibular head, continuing two thirds the length of the leg as well. This path will avoid the peroneal nerve where it exits the fascia. Two corresponding incisions, one into the anterior compartment and one into the lateral compartment are made. Our last compartment syndrome is in the abdomen, and this is associated with severe trauma. Here, the abdominal pressure will increase until perfusion is compromised. For instance, from inferior vena, com inferior, inferior vena cava compression, decreasing the preload. Abdominal distension and hypotension can be noted in affected patients. To diagnose, 
Bladder pressure is used to measure the pressure inside the abdominal cavity. The normal limit for abdominal pressure is less than 10 millimeters of mercury. However, patients with abdominal pressure exceeding 25 millimeters of mercury most often require abdominal decompression. And those patients with a pressure greater than 35 millimeters of mercury are indicated for an emergent abdominal decompression. So that is all that I have um, for the discussion of this video. And I hope that I was able to help you as you dissected the text. I want to give a big thanks to Dr. Segundo Gonzalez Escola. He is the chief editor of the Surgery Basics in 4D interactive book and app.